I grew up on the south side of the city. I was raised with uh, a black mom and a white dad, and uh, I grew up mostly with my mom, and so we lived in mostly uh, all black neighborhoods. I went to all black schools. You have African Americans that um, are currently oppressed by this system that wasn't designed for their prosperity in the first place. How are we going to um, address this issue of racial prejudice and racial injustice? And how will we create a system that allows for all people to prosper um, spiritually and materially? In our region, people in higher castes who work in government offices, in schools, and in public places are always in positions of authority. For this reason, those who are rich are becoming richer, and those who are poor just become poorer and poorer. When will this gap between the castes end? My family in particular is one of those traditional Chilean families. Religion and community life were always very present. I thought there was no room to question these types of traditions, that we were just repeating. I was really longing to find someone to tell me, it's okay for you to think differently, to have a different understanding of the world. When I think of my childhood or I think of my adolescence, it was a violent society and it was a society that was divided. And the way that was expressed was through, uh, really through a war. Often people that you knew got killed. Because it's everywhere, it, it's very difficult to have a, a vision of life that transcends what's happening. I began to ask, questions about the way we lived in this country. You know, why are we a society at war? We don't seem so different. Are we so different? The society I was born into and within which I grew up has its own very beautiful traditions and I like these traditions very much. However, there is still this attitude towards girls that puts them in a lower position than boys. And this attitude becomes an obstacle for girls to pursue an education and fully develop their capacities. Why don't we give the same opportunities to girls? Aren't we, women, also created by God? When my parents got divorced, I was about eight or nine years old. At that age, you don't really understand the long-term kind of implications. This union that's been the source of life, really, that breaks. It really makes me wonder, like, how, how those emotions of fear, of anger, and resentment and helplessness, how they give way to joy, to hope, to the ability 
the ability to rebuild unity in one's family. I was lost, with no purpose. I was a person without any dream, a person without any identity. One of the most difficult things for a human being is to leave his country, leave his home, leave his family. I decided to leave Iraq for a number of reasons, spiritual and material. We would mainly engage in argument to prove that my opinion is better than yours, my religion is better than yours, and my race is better than yours. Was the human being created to develop his soul, or to cause destruction and to create conflicts, which have no solution and no common goal? Thanks to our girls, we are usually up at this time of the day. The girls are knocking on our door and demand to get in. <laughs> so you have no choice but to get up. <laughs> yeah. But have you said your prayers already? You can see some light, you know, ushering in the dawn of a new day. I grew up in a very a religious home with the notion that the religion that I was following was the right one. But, uh, you know, as I grew older, I began to get concerned. Does God not approve of other religions? If someone, for example, was born in another part of the world and they found themselves belonging to another religion where they condemned, I just couldn't believe that God was like that. There had to be an explanation for the existence of different religions. As physicians, we use the clinical method to clearly define what ailment the patient has and prescribe the specific remedy for that illness. Ahaula likens God to a divine physician, and that he has his finger on the pulse of humankind. And so from age to age, God has sent us these manifestations who come with this revelation that is able to solve the problems for that age. So I love coming here at dawn. This is a peaceful, beautiful place. This is the shrine of the Bab who was born 200 years ago. Now, th th this place is full of joy and light, but at the time he was born, the world was really filled with the darkness of oppression for many people. Shiraz, Persia. The young Bob is an extraordinary boy. His astonished teacher sends him home, saying there is nothing he can teach this gifted pupil. While other children play, the Bob prefers to pray and meditate alone. As he grows up to become a young merchant, he is admired for his piety, his gentleness, and his sense of justice. The lives of people throughout Persia will in time come to be transformed by his presence amongst them. In the mid 19th century, there was a worldwide sense of messianic expectation. And in Iran, there was a young man named Mullah Hussein who not only felt this expectation, but was convinced that the promised one that he was searching for was already in the world and that it was his mission to search for him and find him. A spring evening in 1844, Mullah Hussein, a young scholar and seeker after truth, is searching for the Promised One. 
After many weeks of prayer and fasting, Mullah Hussein feels drawn, as if by a magnet, to the city of Shiraz. Renowned for the sweet perfume of its roses and the melodies of its nightingales. At dusk, as he arrives wearily at the city gate, a radiant young man approaches Mullah Hussein and greets him as if he were a lifelong friend. Overwhelmed by this welcome, Mullah Hussein accepts an invitation to visit the stranger's home. During that momentous evening, a conversation takes place that will change Mullah Hussein's life and the entire course of human history. As their conversation continues into the early hours of morning, Mullah Hussein is astonished to discover that every answer he receives to his questions establishes beyond a shadow of a doubt his host's claim that he is the Bab, the promised one, Unknown to a sleeping world, the promised day of God has dawned. I find it so interesting that immediately following the declaration of the Bab in Shiraz, Persia at the time, halfway across the world, Samuel Moss was sending his very first Moscow from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore. May, 1844. For the first time in human history, a message is sent instantly from one city to another. The message, what hath God wrought? And in a way, it's as if humankind had been given two means of communication at the same time. The declaration of the Bab opened a way for humanity to be unified in a spiritual sense. But the advancement in telecommunications since that very first Moscow has led to unprecedented development in science and technology that have unified mankind. The first time I heard about the teachings was in this place, in Vienna. In the beginning, I, I was not interested. And I reacted in a sarcastic way, disbelieving that such a thing could exist. It's impossible that there is a new religion. So I decided to investigate for myself, and not to listen to other people, but to my heart. But every step I took was accompanied by fear. So I asked myself, could we be so lucky? Am I so lucky that God hasn't given up on us and on humanity and sent us a new messenger and for my lifetime? In the days and weeks after the Bab declared his mission to Mullah Hussein, uh, several other individuals came to recognize the Bab independently. And the Bab sent them to different provinces to spread his teachings. Thousands responded, but this alarmed the authorities. Some refused to acknowledge any validity to what the Bab's teachings spoke of. But there were also some that were very attracted to these teachings. <laughs> Hey, do you remember that story we read about Vahid? When the Shah heard about the Babi movement and heard that there was a person who was teaching the people in his city, in Shiraz, he decided to send someone, Vahid, who was one of the most knowledgeable people in Iran at that time in jurisprudence, science and religion. He was an honored and respected man by the Shah and the Iranian society. Tasked by the Shah with investigating the Bab's claims, the proud and accomplished Vahid finds himself utterly powerless in the face of the Bab's wisdom. After their third interview together, Vahid decides to turn his back on his worldly status and dedicate his entire life to the service of the Bab. Along with so many thousands of others, Vahid's acceptance of the Bab and his devotion to him will lead him to offer up his very life 
for the cause he has embraced. In the time of the Bab, the clergy tried to dominate the people through traditions and dogmas that were repeated over and over without understanding why. Everything evolves, and this evolution also applies to religion. So recognizing these recent manifestations is something that liberates the soul and draws us closer to the Creator. When I learned about the Bab, I also discovered the story of Tahre, and it touched me deeply. Tahire was educated at a time when girls were not taught to read or write. Tahire was the first woman to accept the teachings of the Bab. She understood that his teachings were different from those of the past and marked the dawn of a new era. And for this reason, one day she entered a gathering of men with her face uncovered, without a veil. This act was the cause of total shock for the men in that gathering. But by doing this, Tahire demonstrated that it was now time to be rid of the prejudices and superstitions of the past and move into a new day. Thousands of followers of the Bab were arrested and killed. Tahire herself was arrested and brutally murdered. And it is reported that before she was executed, she said, You can kill me as soon as you like, but you can never stop the emancipation of women. Friendship, ancient hatred's record So may love grow From the seed of love we sow The popularity of the Bob grew to such an extent that the authorities finally saw that there was no other way to stop the spread of his faith but to execute him. So in 1850, the order for his execution was issued. When the Bab addresses the crowd um, in the square in Tabriz to this army who has been tasked with this terrible kind of mission to put to death one of God's messengers. And I think it's very poignant because here the Bab is with this um, uh, young devotee beside him, Anis, who w wanted to give his all. The Bab then, he, he actually uses Anis as an example to the crowd. Had you believed in me, O wayward generation, every one of you would have followed the example of this youth, who stood in rank above most of you. The day will come when you will have recognized me. That day I shall have ceased to be with you.
One of the things that the heart is drawn to in relation to the martyrdom of the Bab, I think, is this idea of sacrifice. His only motivation was to carry the message of God to humanity. This plant started as a tiny seed. Then the seed germinated to become a new plant. Just like the seed, if the Bab had not sacrificed himself, we would not have known Baha'u'llah. The Bab means the gate. He came to open the way to a new revelation, to bring about a new civilization. The authorities thought that they had snuffed out the light of the Bab, but really, with his execution, a new power had been released into the world. He had made a decisive break with the past and prepared the way for the coming of him whom God shall make manifest, Baha'u'llah. Baghdad, April 1863. Baha'u'llah, one of the few prominent supporters of the Bab to survive the massacres of the previous years, declares to his companions that he is the great divine educator heralded by the Bab. For the next three decades, uninterrupted divine revelation flows from Baha'u'llah's pen, inspiring people from every background to discover their noblest qualities and create a new pattern of life. For bringing these teachings to humanity, Baha'u'llah endures imprisonment torture, and exile. But the fire lit by the Bab, now rekindled and fanned into flame by Baha'u'llah, cannot be extinguished. Baha'u'llah counsels humanity, O contending peoples and kindreds of the earth, set your faces towards unity and let the radiance of its light shine upon you. from any other religious dispensation in history, this one saw the coming of two manifestations of God in incredibly close succession. And in a way, it was the Bab's purpose to help prepare mankind for the splendor, the light of Baha'u'llah's revelation. We had this kind of caste-based prejudice, but after receiving the teachings of Baha'u'llah, we started to think differently. But then people harassed us. They would say, oh, they go and eat at the homes of the untouchable caste. He slept at a blacksmith's home. Many people were backbiting, making various accusations. We experienced social humiliation.
But we believe that if we do not tolerate these abasements, we cannot progress. My family is related to the Bob. The Bob's uncle was my great, great, great grandfather. But millions of people in the world have a spiritual connection to the Bob. In fact, everyone, all of humanity, has a spiritual connection to the Bob and Baha'u'llah. They came for all people to come together as one family. problems that we are facing collectively as humanity is like a sickness and the revelation of Baha'u'llah is that remedy. It is going to impart life and so we have to take it upon ourselves and put it into action. mature tree is one that produces fruits for others to benefit. One of the signs of maturity is service to others. So in the same way, humanity also has become of age and is, has reached its level of maturity right now. So it is in that context that also what we do here is try to be of service to mankind. And this group that I, I work with is uh, learning how they can how they can advance knowledge in terms of food production so that this community around us can benefit from that knowledge. I wish to welcome you to the official opening of the Ngungu Center for Community Agriculture, which over the past 10 years has been learning how to deliver a community-based education program. Okay, so from the weeds that we've, we've picked, what are the names of these species? You can even uh, tell us the, the farmers donate their local seeds and we plant them here and we start with the local community so that there's no over dependence on, uh, on certified seeds. So these people are seeing here, the promoters in agriculture. So for us, we believe in theory and practice. This is the day of God that I used to read about. It is going to take effort of us, just as ordinary human beings as we are. God has given us this bounty to transform the world into the paradise that we all hoped for. For a long time, we were afraid to come here because we didn't know the neighbors and no one was participating in the activities. Once we began to find some youth and they started their own core activities, those around them began to participate and allow strangers to enter their neighborhood. And little by little, we started to notice the sense of safety you feel and the easy interaction that can occur with any neighbor in the neighborhood, which we couldn't do five years ago. The neighbors themselves arise to serve, bring their children to the activities, and are concerned about the children of the entire community, not just their own. Carrying out these activities in the community is incredible, because you can see how the children are changing. 
And when it happens in the children, it spreads to the whole neighborhood and it expands. And that's what we want to do, right? Bring Baha'u'llah's message of unity to the whole world, of individual and spiritual transformation, and bring service to our lives. I don't think I could see my life without service. I think it would be incomplete. Since the temple was opened, people began to approach it in such a dramatic way. The opportunities to bring souls closer to Baha'u'llah's revelation are infinite. Independent of the efforts we make to bring Baha'u'llah's revelation to the population, Baha'u'llah is already connecting with every soul in Santiago. And that is something we cannot hinder. concept of worship is something that is uh, united in the writings of Baha'u'llah and the Bab with uh, service. The Bab says, the days when idol worship were deemed sufficient have ended, and that the time has come when not but the purest motive supported by deeds of stainless purity would be acceptable unto him. The vision of this house of worship is one in which people come in to say prayers from every background, from every walk of life, but also they flow out of this temple to go and to do deeds that are of service to humankind. Several months ago, I actually didn't really know what the Baha'i Faith was. So I went to the temple for the first time and was so moved by being there that I wanted to learn more. So I met as many people as I could. I went to devotionals, and that's how I met this community. And they told me about the work they were doing in the neighborhood, and it just, to me, was the most obvious way to work towards unity and peace, um, starting at the community level and really working towards making the world a better place. So I felt like I had to get involved in that. I was uh, on a search trying to understand religion, and I went up to the house of worship and sat in and listened to the program that was presented. Basically, I, I, it speaks to me about this vision of who we are as individuals and as a collective. We're one human family, not separate races. It has to be a spiritual solution to this, this issue. And many people, when they come to this temple and they, they feel the spirit when they walk in through the doors, they want to know how can they you know, replicate that in their own neighborhood, in their own community. You know, Baha'is and their friends have been trying to learn about this for some time, where they bring together anyone in their neighborhood, anyone on their block, um, into their homes to say prayers, to converse about the needs of their community, and then to, to go and try to build capacity so that they can be of service to those needs in the community. So this message that Baha'u'llah brings is the educational tool to bring us out of this darkness. We have a tradition in our country of cooking sumarak. We always cook it around the first day of spring. Its cooking process is quite complex and requires the participation of many people. 
kişinin mihlatını talap kıladı. Şu kabı... We need to work for the education and betterment of society in the same way. Almost 50 youth participate in the spiritual education lessons. The program has had a major impact on girls to help them recognize the importance of education in their lives. So, just as we shared sweet sumalak with others, we share the teachings and the program with others. We are now almost 200 people trying to contribute to the betterment of our village. These teachings are the best tool for the unity and progress of our village. Both women and men share the same responsibility for the progress of society. And the results we are achieving belong to all of us not only for our village, but to the whole world and all nations. The teachings of Baha'u'llah and the Bab have a very special resonance in the context of Northern Ireland. It's a society that has been divided along religious lines from its beginning. We drove through two communities that very strongly mark their territory by the symbols in the neighborhood and saying, you know, this is us. You must identify with this particular allegiance. In the context of Belfast, you know, the hub is very significant because like, it stands for something that tries to connect people to something that is for everyone. So do you remember we were talking about thankfulness and being thankful and what we're thankful for? Oh yeah, you do. You remember. Do you not remember we made our It's job? a very diverse neighbourhood and many of the people who live here are young people. And they've seen glimpses of what it can be to for people to work together. We've been trying to um, make it beautiful so it will also be a place that people can come and feel the spirit of what the physical building represents, which is that so powerful is the light of unity, it can illuminate the whole earth. In our process of inviting the friends in that local area to come to the hub, what's behind it is the oneness of humanity. That's the motivating principle. What we are trying to do is work with young people who can get a vision for a future for Northern Ireland that can be unified. Everybody swing your partner. Everybody the fundamental teaching of Baha'u'llah is the oneness of humanity. Your primary allegiance is the humanity, you know, and that it, it must supersede, you know, your allegiance to your nation or to your tribe. A big finish! For the last three years, we've been coming together to serve. Everyone in the village, community leaders, social workers, business owners, the local community bank, and the parents of the children who attend Baha'i children's classes, they are all helping us with this service project.
I have been serving as the village chief for the past 21 years. When the Baha'i program started, I was invited for consultations with them. Because Baha'i activities are going on in our community, it makes my job as chief of the village easier because our village is now safe and secure. I receive suggestions and the spiritual education in the Baha'i program is helping to develop our community even more. It is essential for children to come to children's classes and to receive spiritual education, how to be honest, how to walk on the path of truth, how to develop patience. There should be no caste. The various groups should not be separate. There should be the oneness of humanity in the world. This is happening now. This is a very important development. Through the teachings and principles of Baha'u'llah, we see changes in the everyday lives of the people, in the language they use, their behavior, and their work. In their everyday life, we see Baha'u'llah's teachings being translated into action. So, we're going to colour it straight. We can all paint one and then look at them and be like, okay, that's it, this is what we're working towards, just so we have something that we've actually done and then it's easy to learn or think about how we We are here together, working on a ngatu for our family. In Tonga, the practice of creating ngatu is very much a collective practice. When we look at a beautiful ngatu, what we're seeing is incredible patience um, and love and a group of people that were able to work for something so much greater than just themselves. We're trying to, to create something that we do together. It's a unified family, you know? Yesterday I was waking along, but I was having tears. Because I, I, I know it is something that will prove the unity of a family. We really wanted to do it during the special year of the bicentenary of the birth of the Bab. There's a beautiful quote from the Bab that says that whoever possesseth power over anything must elevate it to its uttermost perfection so that it not be deprived of its own paradise. If we have control over the culture of our family, how do we elevate that also to perfection? If we have a vision of um, our communities that can be more beautiful and more unified, so we have a responsibility to try and work towards that. It's a beautiful way to gain um, perspective or a sense of purpose that's aligned with the teachings of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. They are learning with one another, and there is understanding of how the work in the family benefits the whole community, and they are not separate things. That's what Baha'u'llah has done for us.
There is a team of close friends here in Vienna, all of us from different backgrounds. There are Persians, Austrians, Arabs. And it is a blessing for us to take the responsibility to contribute to the building of our communities. Naga and Hamoudi are both Kurdish. The rest of us are Arabs. Maybe this gathering wouldn't happen in other places, right? <laughs> I think one of the most important things that transformed my life is finding the path of service. Language Cafe is an idea that came from the junior youth program. Considering that the junior youth from ages 11 to 15 are enrolled in school and have quickly learned the local language, they're able to serve their elders and the people who have difficulties learning the language. This age group has so many talents, and at the same time, they have a great sense of purpose and passion to build vibrant communities. Here we see the true attraction to beauty. When so many people from different religions and backgrounds come together as a united and mutually supportive community, we can see the movement of a whole population towards the teachings of Baha'u'llah. The unquestionable truth is love. Love is what we share with everyone in our society. Love is the reason we exist. the resplendent light of God hath appeared in your midst, invested with this unerring book, that ye may be guided aright to the ways of peace, and by the leave of God step out of the darkness into the light, and onto this far-extended path of truth. <laughs>